on March 6, 2025, Starship Block 2 once again exploded in the sky. After careful observation, it was determined that the failure originated from one of the ship's Raptor engines, specifically one of the three vacuum engines. Today, we'll dive into an analysis of what went wrong with this engine and take a new look at this unfortunate flight. Who knows, we might even find a solution to it. First of all, what exactly is a vacuum engine and how does it work? In simple terms, a vacuum-optimized rocket nozzle enhances performance by increasing the surface area, which provides more footholds for the high-pressure gases exiting the combustion chamber to push against. Rocket nozzles achieve maximum efficiency when the exhaust gases have fully expanded to match the ambient pressure at the moment they exit the nozzle. At sea level, however, the ambient air pressure is relatively high so the exhaust gases don't need to expand as much before they equalize with the surrounding environment. In the vacuum of space, exhaust gases must expand much further to match the surrounding pressure. This extra expansion can be harnessed to improve engine efficiency, extracting more energy from the same amount of propellant. In a perfect vacuum, the most efficient nozzle would theoretically be infinite in size. However, engineering and physical infinities don't exactly mix, so rocket scientists have to compromise and design nozzles at a size that's practical for human manufacturing capabilities. But this does not mean that making the nozzle as big as possible is better. The optimal shape of a rocket nozzle continuously evolves as the rocket ascends, due to the gradual decrease in atmospheric pressure with increasing altitude. At lower altitudes, the nozzle must be smaller to accommodate the higher atmospheric pressure, ensuring that the exhaust gases exit the nozzle at a pressure similar to the surrounding air. If the exhaust pressure exceeds the external pressure, the nozzle is considered underexpanded, reducing thrust efficiency. On the other hand, if the exit pressure drops to around 40% or less of the ambient pressure, flow separation occurs. This phenomenon can result in exhaust instabilities that may damage the nozzle, interfere with the vehicle or engine's control, and, in severe cases, lead to engine failure or destruction. Despite its large size, a vacuum rocket engine is not as robust as one might expect. The large nozzles designed for optimal performance in vacuum conditions are structurally fragile, challenging to cool and vulnerable to aerodynamic stresses during the harsh transition from atmosphere to vacuum. Even minor instabilities or structural vibrations during ascent can cause significant damage as the thin, expansive nozzle is much more delicate than the compact nozzle found in traditional engines. And that's exactly what happened to Ship 34's vacuum engine. A preliminary analysis of SpaceX's recent Starship flight indicates that harmonic vibrations in the fuel and oxidizer lines, stronger than those observed during ground tests, may have triggered significant propellant leaks. These leaks led to fires within the engine bay. While it's still unclear whether the issue originated from a fire in the attic, the presence of an unmistakable orange glow in the skirt strongly suggests a fire within the open skirt area. Fire in the skirt area isn't the only thing that affects Ship 34's Raptor vacuum. SpaceX's current hot stage separation technique, in which engines ignite while the stages remain connected, has increased structural stresses. The pressure spike during hot staging, coupled with the chaotic environment created by reflected shock waves from the plume interaction of the six Raptors firing off the hot stage ring, likely directed additional forces back into the engine compartment, contributing to the damage. Anyway, the fragile wrap vac couldn't withstand the intense heat and pressure, leading to a large crack that was noticeable to the naked eye. Additionally, the Raptor vac engine is regeneratively cooled, with numerous thin channels around the nozzle through which liquid methane flows. If any of these channels are externally damaged during hot staging, it can compromise the nozzle's heat resistance, potentially causing it to disintegrate after prolonged use. The fuel leaks also disrupted the engine and its regenerative cooling system, ultimately contributing to the explosion shortly thereafter. It seems that the supposed upgrades for the V2 were the very things that led to its disaster.
Even though these engines are having problems, they are an essential part of Starship that cannot be abandoned. Well, actually, Starship originally didn't require Raptor vacuum engines to function as an orbital spacecraft. In the early stages of the project, Elon Musk proposed a design with seven C-level engines. The SpaceX CEO revealed that Raptor was making such good progress that the company undid the removal of vacuum-optimized engines from Starship's baseline design. But it wasn't long before they decided to build a vacuum version of the Raptor. And they were right. The possibilities of the vacuum engine, especially in space, are too great to ignore. The engine design is largely derived from its C-level optimized counterpart, incorporating the same complex turbo machinery and combustion chambers that make up the core of a rocket engine. The design begins to diverge below the throat of the combustion chamber, where SpaceX has expanded Raptor's existing bell nozzle. These extensions enable the engine to boost its thrust from 230 tons to 258 tons while also increasing both the height and diameter of the engine. Not only do the extensions increase thrust, but they also enhance the engine's specific impulse. Thrust is the force that propels a rocket through the air or space, generated by the rocket's propulsion system based on Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. As gas or working fluid is accelerated out the rear of the rocket engine nozzle, the rocket moves in the opposite direction. Specific impulse is the ratio of thrust produced to the weight flow of the propellants, serving as a measure of a rocket engine's fuel efficiency. Simply put, the higher the specific impulse, the better the engine utilizes its propellant. To protect the extended nozzle, a white ceramic thermal barrier coating is used on the inside to cut down on the heat transfer through the wall. Additionally, the nozzle is integrated with extended, regeneratively cooled channels. In rocket engine design, regenerative cooling involves passing some or all of the propellant through tubes, channels, or a jacket surrounding the combustion chamber or nozzle to cool the engine. This method remains the primary approach for managing thermal loads in thrust chambers. Typically, the rocket fuel itself acts as the coolant, entering the engine through passages near the nozzle exit. It then travels through the high heat throat region and exits near the injector face. These passages are created by brazing cooling tubes to the thrust chamber or milling channels along the chamber walls. The smaller cross sections of these passages increase the coolant velocity, maximizing cooling efficiency in the high heat areas. Since the Raptor engine's fuel is all at cryogenic temperatures, this method is particularly effective. Because SpaceX's goal is Mars and beyond, the vacuum engine plays an extremely important role in helping Starship carry out deep space missions. If the vacuum engine cannot be replaced, then what should we do? There are two types of solutions to this. One is a temporary fix, while the other is a permanent solution. As for the temporary solution, I was thinking of a way that might help the ship survive, even if an accident occurs. During Flight 8, after one of the vacuum engines exploded, the remaining engines kept running despite the ship spinning wildly. That's when it occurred to me that one way to temporarily address this issue would be to shut down the RVACs when vibrations become too intense and rely solely on the sea-level raptors to keep flying. Obviously, this won't solve the underlying problem, but it would allow them to complete the mission profile and provide valuable test data for the rest of the system, such as the Starlink deployer and heat shield. To do this, we need software enhancements to gain better control, both proactively and automatically. Additionally, these software updates will also account for the scenario where all three center engines go offline. In that case, the differential thrust will be used to steer with the remaining outer engines. First, the software will automatically deactivate all RVAC engines if any one engine fails to prevent instability. In the event of engine failure, cold gas thrusters will be engaged to stop any spin. Additionally, if all engines are offline, the system will use aerodynamic surfaces to help stabilize and control the vehicle. Finally, the software will be enhanced to autonomously guide Starship to a safe termination either by flying it away from land or directing it to a specific graveyard location. These enhancements will provide proactive and automatic control,
improving flight safety, and ensuring a secure response to engine failures or other emergency situations. These changes, particularly the last one, offer several key advantages. They reduce the risk of debris causing harm to people. Better control ensures the ship does not fall into an unwanted area, minimizing the chance of littering land with wreckage and negative publicity, preventing the spectacle of failed re-entries that can look disastrous to observers. And who knows, SpaceX might even be able to recover a whole starship for analysis, providing valuable data for future missions. Well, that's about the temporary solution. So what about the long-term solution? The ultimate solution is to address the root cause of the fire, which stems primarily from the poor design of Starship Block 2. Both Starship versions 1 and 2 are powered by six Raptor engines. Fuel is delivered to the engines through four downcomers. Three smaller ones supply the vacuum Raptors, while the central downcomer feeds the inner three engines. The central downcomer is connected to a large sump rather than directly to the methane tank. In the Block 1 design, there is only a single downcomer, but the Block 2 configuration includes two additional downcomers, which route methane and oxygen from the header tanks, and a LOX downcomer extends into the LOX tank. These new tubes could have complicated the propulsion system, and often the more complex the system, the more vulnerable it is, especially in the violent vibrations of orbital flight. The question is, why make this change? As the fuel mass flow requirements for the engines increase, likely as the Raptors are upgraded for higher thrust, the reliability of using a central distribution point could become a concern. If cavitation issues arise in the piping, or if the increased flow induces additional stress on the plumbing, these could be valid reasons for the change. The slanted RVAC downcomers seem to serve a structural purpose as well. By having each RVAC downcomer potentially share some of the load from the RVAC with the common dome, it's possible to reduce the number of stringers in the LOX tank, which could lead to a lighter overall system. However, the most significant reason for these modifications is likely preparation for Starship Block 3. While this new setup may not be necessary for three RVACs, it could become essential for six. By implementing it now, they can ensure the system is ready well in advance. SpaceX now needs to conduct static fire tests at various LOX levels and potentially with different structural configurations in order to replicate the conditions that led to the issue with Ship 34. This will help them pinpoint exactly what went wrong. Another crazy idea is to launch the ship alone, similar to the old SN8-SN15 tests. With minimal fuel and LOX in the tanks, the main goal would be to simulate the G-forces experienced toward the end of the ship's burn. This would likely generate similar levels of resonant vibrations, providing an opportunity to test the piping configuration. In any case, there's no way it's going to get the next flight ready in four to six weeks. But that's fine. There's no rush. The ship being able to fly is the only thing that matters.